Some people are just born under a dark cloud, I mean a really, really dark cloud, the kind that rains down misfortune like a monsoon. Our protagonist, let's call him Bob, was one of these unfortunate souls. Bob wasn't just unlucky, he was a walking, talking embodiment of Murphy's Law. If something could go wrong for Bob, it would. And if it couldn't go wrong, it would find a way to go wrong anyway, just to spite him. His life was a comedy of errors, a never-ending slapstick routine that left audiences, mostly his neighbors, either in stitches or shaking their heads in disbelief. From stubbing his toe on the same brick three times in a row to ordering soup on a scorching summer day, only to find a fly doing the backstroke in it, Bob's life was an epic tale of woeful misadventures. You see, Bob wasn't just unlucky. He was a magnet for misfortune, a lightning rod for the absurd. He was the guy who'd find a $100 bill on the sidewalk only to have it blown into an open sewer grate moments later. He was the guy who'd win a free cruise only to come down with a severe case of seasickness the moment the ship left the port. Yes, Bob's life was a symphony of misfortune, a chaotic concerto of calamities orchestrated by the cruel hand of fate. And the worst part? He was used to it. He'd long given up on trying to understand why the universe seemed to have a personal vendetta against him. He just accepted it as his lot in life, a cosmic joke he was destined to be the punchline of. Little did he know, however, that his luck was about to take an even more absurd and hilarious turn. One particularly dreadful Tuesday, Bob's string of misfortunes reached new heights. It all started innocently enough. He woke up, tripped over his cat, who, naturally, decided to sleep at the foot of his bed and spilled coffee on his only clean shirt. Just another Tuesday, he sighed, reaching for the instant coffee. But little did Bob know, this was just the tip of the iceberg. He left his apartment, late for work as usual, and that's when the domino effect of his bad luck truly kicked in. First, a flock of pigeons mistook him for a public restroom, leaving his suit jacket splattered with a rather unpleasant souvenir. Then, while rushing to catch the bus, he stepped in a puddle that turned out to be more than just water. Let's just say it involved a dog, a fire hydrant, and a distinct lack of civic responsibility from the dog's owner. As if that wasn't enough, the bus he finally managed to catch after a 45-minute delay, naturally, decided to take the scenic route. A very, very long scenic route. It turned out the bus driver was new and had somehow missed the memo about not taking the scenic route during rush hour. By the time Bob reached his workplace, two hours late, drenched in questionable fluids and smelling vaguely of pigeon droppings, he was ready to crawl back into bed and pull the covers over his head. Unfortunately for Bob, his boss wasn't exactly known for his understanding or forgiving nature. You're fired! Get out of my sight before I make you clean the office toilets with a toothbrush! And just like that, Bob was unemployed, covered in a variety of unsavory substances and wondering if it was too late to take up residence in a monastery somewhere in the Himalayas. Now, you might think that losing his job would be the low point of Bob's day. You'd be wrong. Remember that lottery ticket he'd bought earlier that morning? The one he'd forgotten about during his disastrous commute? Well, it turned out to be a winner. A big winner. As in, quit your job and buy a yacht kind of winner. The problem? He'd left the ticket in his other pants the ones currently enjoying a spin cycle in the washing machine. As he fished out the soggy, illegible mess that was once his ticket to a life of luxury, Bob couldn't even muster the energy to cry. This was beyond tragic. It was hilariously, absurdly, cosmically unfair. It was as if the universe had decided to give him a taste of the good life, just to snatch it away at the last second and rub his nose in his own misfortune. Dejected, defeated, and smelling faintly of lavender fabric softener, Bob trudged back to his apartment. He stepped over a stray banana peel because, of course, narrowly avoided colliding with a runaway shopping cart, and rode the elevator with a woman who seemed to have mistaken the entire bottle of her perfume for a single spritz. By the time he reached his apartment door, he was convinced that the universe was conspiring against him, determined to make his life a living, breathing sitcom where he was the hapless protagonist and the laugh track was provided by the gods of misfortune. This is it, he muttered to himself as he fumbled with his keys. I can't take it anymore, I'm done. Inside his small cluttered apartment, Bob paced back and forth, his mind racing. He had to do something, anything to change his luck. He considered moving to a new city, maybe even a new country, but then he remembered his passport had expired last month and the thought of navigating the bureaucratic labyrinth of the passport office was enough to make him want to crawl under his bed and stay there. He thought about consulting a fortune teller, 
but then he imagined the look on their face when they saw his aura, or whatever it is fortune tellers see. They'd probably charge him double just to cleanse their crystal ball of the bad vibes he'd undoubtedly bring with him. He even briefly contemplated taking up extreme sports, figuring if he was going to be constantly plagued by misfortune, he might as well get some adrenaline out of it. He quickly dismissed that idea, however, after picturing himself tripping over a bungee jumping cord or getting attacked by a mountain goat while attempting to climb Mount Everest. No drastic measures were needed. Bob reached a decision. He was going to end it all. Not his life, of course. That would be too easy, too straightforward. No, Bob was going to end his suffering in a way that was as absurd and comical as his life had become. He was going to fake his own kidnapping. He spent the next few hours crafting a ransom note, demanding a surprisingly modest sum of money. He wasn't greedy after all, just desperate. He then staged his apartment to look like a struggle had taken place, scattering cushions from the sofa, overturning a lamp, and even drawing a fake bloodstain on the rug using ketchup and red food coloring. With his masterpiece complete, Bob stepped outside his apartment building, ready to put his plan into action. He was going to walk into the nearest alleyway, wait a few minutes, and then emerge, disheveled and distraught, claiming to have escaped his kidnappers. The alleyway was dark, damp, and smelled vaguely of stale beer and desperation. Perfect. Bob took a deep breath and strode into the shadows, bracing himself for the imaginary struggle that was about to ensue. He closed his eyes, picturing a burly figure tackling him to the ground, demanding his wallet and phone. He waited, and waited. Nothing happened. He opened one eye, then the other, peering into the darkness. Still nothing. Well, this is anticlimactic, Bob muttered to himself, feeling a familiar sense of disappointment wash over him. Just as he was about to abandon his half-baked plan and return to his apartment, he heard a voice behind him. Ant, as thug. Well, well, well. What do we have here? The voice growled, thick with menace. Bob turned slowly, his heart pounding in his chest. Standing before him was a hulking figure, clad in a leather jacket and ripped jeans, a sneer etched across his face. The thug cracked his knuckles menacingly, the glint of a switchblade catching the dim light of the street lamp above. Looks like you're in the wrong part of town, pal, he snarled, taking a menacing step closer. Bob's mind raced. This wasn't part of the plan. He'd imagined a fake kidnapping, not a real-life encounter with a genuine article thug. This was too much even for his level of misfortune. He stammered, trying to explain that it was all a misunderstanding, that he wasn't worth robbing, but the words caught in his throat. He was doomed. This was it. The grand finale of his miserable existence. The thug leaned in close, his breath hot on Bob's ear. Ant, as thug, don't worry, he whispered, a cruel smile spreading across his face. This won't hurt a bit. Bob closed his eyes, bracing himself for the worst. But the blow never came. Instead, Bob heard a startled yelp, followed by a loud thud and a string of curses that would make a sailor blush. He cautiously opened his eyes to witness a sight so unexpected, so utterly bizarre, that it took him a moment to process. The thug was sprawled on the ground, his face contorted in pain, a look of utter disbelief etched across his features. Standing over him, holding a half-eaten tuna sandwich in one hand and a look of righteous indignation on her face, was a little old lady with a blue rinse perm and a floral print dress. Don't you dare try to mug that nice young man, she screeched, shaking the sandwich at the day's thug. Not in my neighborhood. It turned out the little old lady was a retired professional wrestler and she had a mean right hook, even with a tuna sandwich in her hand. She had seen the whole thing unfold from her apartment window overlooking the alleyway and had decided to take matters into her own hands. The thug, nursing a bruised ego and a sore jaw, scrambled to his feet and fled into the night, muttering something about crazy old bats and bad career choices. Bob, still in shock, could only stare at his unlikely savior, the woman who had inadvertently saved him from a fate worse than his already unfortunate existence. Are you all right, dearie? The little old lady asked, her voice surprisingly gentle now that she wasn't threatening to turn a thug into a human pretzel. Bob could only nod, speechless, as the weight of the entire day, the week, his entire life crashed down on him. He had been saved. But at what cost? What fresh hell awaited him now?